Just before this episode, I wanted to tell you you can get more from Never A Truer Word by subscribing on Spotify. If you are a Spotify listener, and 90% of you are according to the stats, then you can subscribe to get early access to the weekly episodes, video episodes, so you can follow along with the statements, exclusive subscriber episodes, and a chance to leave comments for future episodes too. Go to the Spotify page for Never A Truer Word and press subscribe or unlock. And if you do decide to subscribe, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Scott Peterson wants a chance to show you he's innocent. And should you give him the benefit of the doubt? That's what we're going to look at in this episode from Never a Truer Word, where we look at the words that people choose to use to see if they're telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And look to give you some of the confidence that comes from truly understanding what people are saying with their words all around you. And this is part one of looking at Scott Peterson, one of the most requested people for me to analyze in these episodes. And I had a look at a 22 minute long interview that he gave when his wife Lacey was supposedly missing. And I could not cut a bit out of it. Everything was right for analysis, even when he was asked the same question twice. So this is part one. Bit of background, Scott Peterson um, killed his wife Lacey, was convicted of that murder in 2004, and now the LA Innocence Project have said they've got new evidence that suggests he didn't kill Lacey. So let's look and analyse this interview where he says things like this. Yeah, we go through a range of emotions from anger to frustration to grief. And we'll analyse it using the principles in the book Truthful Deception. Um, And we're going to start off with just having no preconceptions. Let's pretend we know nothing about this. We don't know anything about what he's done. Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt and look at the words he uses in this interview. As you're doing this, I want you to watch for what is important to him, what's important to Scott. And that's going to come across in two ways. It's going to come across in the things that he says a lot and the words he repeats a lot. That's going to show what's important to him What we need to work out when we find out what is important to him is why is it important to him? Is it important to him because it's the top priority in his mind? It's what he's thinking about all the time. So the words are leaking out. Or is it important to him because he wants to give us a certain impression of events and a certain impression of himself? So he keeps repeating things to make sure that we really get the message. Have a look at what's missing. Scott, in this interview, his wife Lacey has been missing for about a month. What would we expect to hear from a husband whose wife had gone missing uh, and doesn't know what has happened? What would we expect to hear from that person? And does Scott match up with that? Or are there things missing? And look for leakage as well. Leakage is when someone is hiding things from us, they're being deceptive. But it's a highly stressful situation giving a television interview. So perhaps that stress will make some of the truth leak out. Are you ready? Let's have a look at the first questions in the interview. First of all, describe what the past month has been for you. That's been absolutely terrible as it is for everyone. I mean, you see us in press conference. You haven't seen me as much in the media, but you see our families and the raw emotion that's out there and the grief, um, the frustration. You know, we go through a range of emotions from anger to frustration to grief. For me, it's uh, a, uh, it comes at different times during the day. Two weeks ago, I knew exactly what to do. I'd go to the volunteer center at the Red Lion and open up the center and wait for the volunteers to come and work on things. And, and then I'd go out and put up flyers. I knew exactly what to do, and that was going to bring Lacey home. Um, and now I don't know exactly what to do, and that's so frustrating. That's the hardest part. I mean, we have a... A core group of volunteers still working to get her picture out there nationally through corporations and organizations and obviously media and other means. So we continue to work tirelessly, um, many people do, to bring her home. And we can do that during the day. And unfortunately at night, don't know what to do and the, the grief hits and it's unbearable. But you, you also have to recognize that Lacey is hurting worse than any of us. She's the one that's not with our family. She's the one that we need to find and bring home. I know you have so That gives you focus, it gives you, yeah. You know, there are times when you just can't continue and you have to, if you're driving, you have to pull over and stop. And if you're doing something, you just uh, can't continue. 
um, trusty visiting, have a task, to know what to do, a positive task, and try to try to focus on that. That's the first few questions. And when I watched that video, that was what made me want to analyze this. The first question that Scott's asked is to describe how the past month has been for him. And he talks about that and he uses the word grief twice in his answer. He says there's a raw emotion out there and the grief. And we go through a range of emotions from anger to frustration to grief. What does grief mean? Well, grief is a word that we associate with death and loss. It's a final word. We grieve things we no longer have. Now, as he's giving this interview, he wants to tell us that he is searching for Lacey. He doesn't know where she is. He doesn't know what's happened to her. Lacey has disappeared at the point in this interview. So why is he saying that there is grief there? That got me very interested. Why is he using a word associated with death and associated with permanent loss? Grief. First thing that got me interested. The next thing was how closely he wants to be identified with others. He uses joint pronouns here. He says, I mean, you see us in press conferences, uh, but you see our families. And, you know, we go through a range of emotions. Why, why is he wanting to join himself to other people here? He's been asked, how's, that, how's it been for you? Um, and he's joining himself with other people. Well, I, there's two reasons why they, I think this is the case. Number one is he might not want to be seen as an outcast. There is a reason why he might be seen as an outcast at the point this interview is given. And so he's looking to say, look, I'm joined up with other people. I'm part of us and our and we. I am not an outcast. Other people believe in me. But he has been asked about what it's been like for, for you. And when he does talk about you, which is, is him, um, he doesn't really go into any detail at all. He says, oh, it's been absolutely terrible, as it is for everyone. So he talks about himself tinily and says it's been t absolutely terrible and then talks about how it is for everyone. And then he says, for me, it comes at different times during the day. So he's not talking about his own emotions there at all. He talks about the timing and the severity. It's been terrible uh, and it comes at different times during the day. Now, why is that? Why can he not talk about his emotions? He talks about other people's emotions, but he doesn't talk specifically about him. And he's been asked about him. So why would that be? Well, it could be he just doesn't have access to his emotions. He's a cold person. Um, it might be he doesn't want to describe his emotions. He's a closed person. It could be that he's lying about his emotions. He cannot tell us about his emotions because to tell us about his emotions, it would not be real. Or if we found out what his real emotions are, we'd be horrified. Or it could be he has no emotions. But certainly, whatever the reasons are, he is not talking about his emotions. The tenses in this first part of the, the answer are really telling as well. He's asked how the past month has been. So describe how the past month has been for you. That's not what happened. It's has been. So this is an emotional question around feelings, around inside his head. And he says, it's been terrible. So that's the been part. That's the past part. And then he talks about the everything in the present tense. So as it is for everyone in the present tense, raw emotion that's out there. So that's present tense. We go through a range of emotions, present tense. And for me, it comes at different times during the day. So that is present tense. So he's not really talking about what has been happening over the past month. He, for some reason, doesn't want to tell us about his experiences over the past month. He wants to talk about maybe the, the, the group emotions that are there, but he's not describing his own emotions. When we list things, when we order things, we very often give the highest priority, the most important thing, the first place in the list, and then work down that list in decreasing order of priority. Here, he talks about emotions, and the first list he makes is he says, there's grief, and frustration or grief, um, the frustration. Uh, so grief was the very first emotion that he mentioned. Grief, as we've spoken about, that finality of grief. And then frustration is the second one. And then uh, he catches himself. So he doesn't really finish that thought. And he talks about, you know, the range of emotions and he gives a new list of emotions. This one starts with anger. Then he mentions frustration again, and then grief. I wonder if he realizes he's mentioning grief as his priority it was not such a good look for him. So that's why he restates this list with grief at the end and talks about anger and grief. Now, what's missing? Well, there's no sense of worry about Lacey, no sense of 
concern about Lacey, no sense of anguish inside himself that he cannot help Lacey or that she is going through unsufferable things that he cannot help with. So when he's asked how the past month has been for him, he talks about himself and the people that are around him currently in the present tense, but he doesn't talk about Lacey. He doesn't talk about any concern for her at all or any worry for her at all. Now, this next part is interesting. He said, two weeks ago, I knew exactly what to do. I go to the volunteer centre at the Red Lion and open up the centre and wait for the volunteers to come and work on things. Uh, and then I go out and put up flyers. This feels to me like a resume statement. Look at all the good work that I'm doing. Look at how good I am. How could I possibly have killed my wife? Because I'm trying really, really hard with good people. That's why he talks about volunteers. You know, I'm working with volunteers, a, a virtuous thing to do. And I'd open up the center i'd be the first one there and i'd open up the center i'd wait for those volunteers so that's the use of volunteers again and then i go out and put up flyers wow that just feels like a resume statement look how hard i'm working look how good i am and i spot a hint of is it arrogance is it status is it control there he says he gets to the center and he opens it up but he, in his own words he doesn't do anything he waits for the volunteers to come and work before he does anything. So he gets to that center, he opens it up, but he doesn't do anything. He waits for the volunteers to come and do things. Only once they've arrived, he wants to give us the impression that he went out and put up flyers. But if you notice, he says this part in the present tense. Um, I wait for the volunteers to come and work um, on things and then I go out and put up flyers. So he's using the present tense. I don't really believe there's a lot of truth in what's going on there, um, apart from he really wants us to know how hard he was working. He, he wants to give us his resume so that we hire him and go, what a great guy. He continues and says, I knew exactly what to do, and that was going to bring Lacey home. Um, and now I don't know exactly what to do. And that's so frustrating. That's the hardest part. And we've got that word frustrating again. So he's used frustration and he's used frustrating. So when I talked about things, he repeats, is this leakage? Is he finding everything that's going on extremely frustrating at the moment? And if he is, then why is that? You notice that he said he knew exactly what to do that was going to bring Lacey home and now he doesn't know exactly what to do. He doesn't mention why that's changed and he does say, I don't know exactly what to do. So that is, I know what to do. I just maybe not exact on it. But he's talking about some external events that have changed things here, which we'll come on to in a minute. But he's blaming these, well, external events actually brought on by him. But he's blaming other people for his lack of focus now that he can devote to finding Lacey. Not his fault. Not his fault what happened, not his fault that people doubt him. It's other people's fault. It's external events and he doesn't know exactly what to do. Again, I've got this sense that he doesn't want to portray himself as an outcast. He wants to show that he has joined up with other people. I mean, we have a core group. So there's a core group there. There's volunteers still working. So many volunteers, plural of volunteers. We continue to work tirelessly. Many people do. So he really wants us to know that he's not alone, that he's working with other people. And I think a lot of what Scott is doing in this interview is perception management. He wants to show the world that he's not on his own. He's not an outcast from other people that were close to Lacey. He's still part of we and volunteers and many people. He lists the people that um, he's giving the picture to in order to get coverage for, for, for Lacey's disappearance. And again, in order, he starts with corporations, organizations, and lastly, he mentions the media. Now, I don't know about you, but I would think if I wanted to get someone's picture out there so that um, she was recognized to help with search to bring her home, I would start with media. So why does he put media last? Is it a distaste for the media after they printed some stories and allegations about him that he didn't like? He wants to say, we don't need the media because we've got corporations and organizations to go to first. Or is it a sense of putting the interviewer down? She's part of the media, this interviewer. And does he want to say, look, you're third of my priorities. You're blooming lucky that I'm talking to you because I've got corporations and I've got organizations before I talk to you. I did say I would give Scott Peterson the benefit of the doubt. And here's some reassuring things I see in his answer. He talks about Lacey by her first name. He calls her Lacey. Uh, he could have called her her, which would imply some distance and disdain for her. Um, he could have called her my wife, which would have shown some ownership. But no, he calls her by that close, familiar term, 
Lacey. And he says he's working to bring her home. Very often um, when a guilty person is talking about someone that's missing, where they've got guilty knowledge of what's happened to that person, they talk about a search and they talk about that person being found because they realise that person is not going to come home under their own steam. They realise that person cannot be persuaded to return. Um, so they talk about that person being found. Uh, they talk about that person uh, being needed to be searched for. And what he wants to do is bring her home. So that's reassuring for me as well. Scott continues, and we can do that during the day and unfortunately at night, don't know what to do. The grief hits and it's unbearable. There's that word again, grief. So once more, he's talking about grief, that finality of grief, that death that grief implies, that loss, that permanent loss that the word grief implies. Maybe once if he'd said it, it's a bit of a slip, but this is the third time he's used the word grief now, even though he has nothing to grieve for. Yes, he may be extremely worried that Lacey is never coming back if she'd been missing for so long, um, but he doesn't talk about worry. He doesn't talk about anguish. He doesn't talk about hope. He talks about grief. He talks about um, how this happens unfortunately at night and unfortunately is one of his favourite words that we'll see time and time again in this interview. Um, unfortunately suggests bad luck. Uh, you know, it's things that have happened outside of our control. They are unfortunate. And also, we don't use unfortunate in a really great way. You know, unfortunately, there was a car crash and 10 people were killed. You know, that would be tragically. Um, so unfortunate, just a little bit of bad luck. And he uses it a lot. And who's he talking about again here? He says, we can do that during the day. Unfortunately, at night, don't know what to do. He doesn't use a pronoun before the, the night description. He doesn't say, unfortunately, at night, I don't know what to do. He doesn't connect himself to this at all, almost as if there is no connection to it. He can't commit to saying, I don't know what to do. He just says, don't know what to do. And then he talks about you. So when he talks about night, he says, it's unbearable, but you have to recognize Lacey is hurting worse than any of us. That gives you focus. Now, why doesn't he say, but I have to recognize Lacey, Lacey is hurting worse than me, and that gives me focus. Why does he talk about you here? Well, there's two reasons people will use this concept of talking about you. One of them is put yourself in my shoes. Uh, you know, have a think about how I feel. I'm going to make you really feel it stronger by making you feel it and you think about how you would feel rather than telling you how I would feel. So that's one of the reasons that people do it. The other reason is they don't have those thoughts. So instead of talking about how I feel because they don't have the genuine, authentic experience to say that, they talk about how you feel, how someone distant should feel in that moment. I do have more reassurance. He talks about Lacey again by that familiar first name implying closeness. And he says Lacey is hurting worse than any of us in the present tense. Very often, someone who's pretending that their um, loved one's are missing and they don't know what has happened to that person will slip into the past tense, you know, and say was hurting worse um, or was a nice person. But he talks about her in the present tense here. Lacey is hurting worse than any of us. And once again, we've got this concept of bringing her home, which I quite like. However, Lacey is hurting worse than any of us, he says. That is his words. That is his facts. Lacey is hurting worse than any of us. Well, how does he know that? Because as he's talking and giving this interview, she's disappeared. And he's claiming not to know why she disappeared. Uh, so she could have gone off. Or, uh, you know, she might have wanted to go off. She might have wanted to disappear. She might um, be in a better place now than she was back then. She may have all those things. Even if she wasn't thinking straight or anything like that, she may be in a happier place where she, where she is now than she was there. So why does he say Lacey is hurting worse than any of us? Is that leakage and he says that gives you yeah yeah there are times when you just can't continue and you have to you're driving you have to pull over and stop and if you're doing something you just can't continue um says something unclear have a task to know what to do a positive task to try to try to focus on that once again he talks about what's happening with you not with himself that gives you there are times when you can't continue you have to you're driving you have to pull over you're doing something you just can't continue so once more he's not talking specifically about himself and what he's experienced why is that well one of the reasons is he's not experiencing any of this at all it's just things he thinks he should say that will create a good impression but he can't attach himself to it so he talks about you and he talks twice there you 
yeah, there are times when you just can't continue. If you're doing something, you can't continue. What, what does that mean? He doesn't, he's not very clear with this whatsoever. One of the reasons that people are not clear when they say something is it's not real. It's not, when people have authentic words to describe a feeling or an event, then very often they'll use those authentic words and create a really clear picture in her head. But he, not, he doesn't do that here. You know, I don't understand what it is that he can't continue doing. And I don't understand why he can't continue doing something. So I'm wondering there, what is it that he can't continue doing? The interviewer asked, her, uh, asked him at the end of that clip, I know there are certain places you can't go to. It's hard to go to the park. He says it's hard to go. Yeah, he doesn't finish that thought. He doesn't actually say it is hard to go to the park. He says it's hard to go. Yeah. And then he says it's important though because these mornings when down there alone, yeah, I feel closer to her. Maybe that's an attempt to communicate or something. Yeah. There's a lot of vagueness at the end there. I feel closer to her. Maybe, so just maybe, not definitely, that's an attempt to communicate or something. So we've got a maybe and we've got an or something in there. So I don't really know what does this mean? What is he trying to talk about there? It's not very clear. Once again, is this an authentic experience or feeling event that he's describing? Or is he just saying words that he thinks will sound good? I'll tell you what does worry me is that he says when he's at the park, there's an attempt to communicate now, Lacey, as he's telling this story, is still alive and is somewhere. So why is he attempting to communicate with her on this spiritual level? Because this very much to me sounds like the way you would attempt to communicate with someone who is dead. Uh, this is that spiritual level where you go somewhere that was maybe a place where you enjoyed together and you feel closer to that person because they cannot be closer to you anymore. They can't physically be closer to you anymore because they're dead and you attempt to communicate on a spiritual level, talk to them inside your head, maybe receive messages from them. That's what we do with people who are dead. I don't, I've never been aware of anyone doing this spiritual attempt to communicate with someone who is still alive. Now, before we go on, remember you guys are the marketing department for Never A Truer Word and your job is to press the like button to help this get to more people or to share it with people. A lot of people I know are interested in the Scott Peterson case and the developments around the, the Innocence Project. So share this video as well with your networks. Let's get this to as many people as possible. Always interested in your comments as well. So if you can leave them in this platform, please do. You can get in touch on social media. Um, where you can find all the links in the show description. And if you hit the subscribe or follow buttons, then you'll be able to get new episodes, including part two, when they land. And if you want early access to part two, then why not become a member of the YouTube channel or a subscriber on Spotify, where you'll get early access to all the weekly episodes and exclusive members-only content too. Let's have some more from Scott. And you mentioned right off the, the start that you haven't been in the media. No. No. Um, it was um, for the first three days or so when she disappeared. It was a, a absolute privacy issue, not showing the, the grief of our family, not exploiting that. After that, it was a conscious decision to remain out of the media eye, decided upon by everyone in the family and the volunteers in order to, and I'm sorry to say it, uh, to media, but to keep the media here, to keep them hungry for, um, you know, an interview with me or a picture so that they would keep coming back so this story won't fall you know, through the cracks as it has happened with other missing people, with other abductions. Um, and it's up to the family to keep that going. So we made that conscious decision together that I wouldn't speak. Obviously, we did lots of media with the rest of the family. Um, and to keep them here, I didn't. But unfortunately now, the suspicions of me have grown so great due to um, people you know, wondering what happened to um, the you know, inappropriate relationship that I had with, with Amber Fry that it's necessary um, to speak, it's appropriate time to, in order to ask people to keep looking for Lacey because they're not looking for Lacey as much as they should be right now. The interviewer says to him, and you mentioned right off the start that you haven't been in the media. Scott says, no, no. And she asks, why? And he says, it was um for the first three days or so when she disappeared, it was um an absolute privacy issue, not showing the grief of her family, not exploiting that. So here is that word again. It's the grief. 
And he says the grief was felt in the first three days. Biggest sign yet that something's gone on here because he's saying within the first three days, so there must have been lots of hope uh, amongst anyone that thought Lacey had disappeared in the first three days. Lots of searching for her, lots of, you know, just please let her be there. He says that the, the emotion there that he didn't want to show was grief. Grief that we feel after death or a permanent loss. Huge, huge red flag. He talks about the fact that he, that he didn't do any of these press conferences and he uses some very curious language around it. He says it was a conscious decision. He said it was a conscious decision to remain out of the media eye and we made a conscious decision together. Uh, he also says it was decided upon by everyone in the family and the volunteers. Uh, so he's used this twice. I don't think it was a conscious decision. He wants to say it was a very conscious, thought, thought through decision that was made with the family, the volunteers. It was a decision that was made together. I don't think so. I think Scott is someone who can't be seen to be losing or to be out of control. And I think there's been some discussions that went on to keep Scott out of the limelight. But what he wants us to think is this was a conscious decision. By the way, not just a decision, oh yeah, but a conscious decision. And it was made by everyone in the family. And we made that conscious decision together. A very, very interesting choice of words from the guy there. I'll tell you what I won't be doing, and that's hiring Scott Peterson as my media strategist, because what he's suggesting there is in order to keep interest up in the story, in order to keep Lacey's name out there, what he did was not talk to the press. I mean, how does that work? I'm not hiring him to do my media strategy anytime soon. And is there a hint of arrogance here that he thinks he's the main draw, he's the star of the show, and what he wants to do is hold himself back and have people begging for interviews, begging for pictures. I get a sense of arrogance there from the way that he spoke. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, he just does join Lacey up with other missing people with other abductions. He says he doesn't want the story to fall, fall through the cracks, as has happened with other missing people and with other abductions. So he's joining Lacey up, not with dead people, but with other missing people and with other abductions. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he like I like that. He says, unfortunately, suspicions of me have grown so great due to people, you know, wondering what happened to, um, you know, the inappropriate relationship that I had with Amber Fry. Once again, I'm getting ego, I'm getting arrogance, I'm getting control. He says, the suspicions of me have grown so great, not because he had this inappropriate relationship with Amber Fry, but it's because of people's reaction to this relationship with Amber Fry. The suspicions of me have grown so great due to, not the relationship, but due to people wondering what happened with the relationship. Now, that is a really, really telling. It wasn't his fault. It was everyone else's fault. Oh, by the way, this was unfortunate. Unfortunately, the suspicions have grown. He uses two opposite terms here, inappropriate and appropriate. He says, what happened with the inappropriate relationship I had with Amber Fry? It's necessary to speak. It's an it's appropriate time. So he's used inappropriate and appropriate. Is this someone who sees the world in very black or white terms? This was an inappropriate thing. This is an appropriate thing. There's no gray areas with him. So things are either good or they are bad. And by the way, uh, he's used, unfortunately, an inappropriate and appropriate, very clinical terms for something, you know, very black, white terms, not very large emotional terms either. You know, unfortunately, inappropriate. And he talks about inappropriate relationship. I mean, you, that's one way of describing an affair you had with someone while married and while that person you were married to was pregnant with your child. Inappropriate is probably the smallest but most, you know, honest word, not the most honest word, but an honest word that could be used, but it's very, very small to use. So he's minimizing what is happening there at all. And also there's some guilt shaming going on here now, isn't there? This, you know, the reason that he's an outcast, the reason people think that he murdered um, Lacey, um, in his head, in his telling of it, is not because he had a relationship with Amber Fry, but it's people People's reaction to Amber Fry and people's reaction to this is get is not to look for Lacey because they think what's the point she's dead and it's his fault but he's saying it's not his fault it's the people's fault it's due to the people's reaction and due to that they are not looking for Lacey as much as they should be so if Lacey is not found it's not my fault because I had an affair it's your fault for your reaction to that news don't like that at all and there's a shift here I spoke before about how I was quite happy to see him say he wanted to bring Lacey home. But I think for the rest of the interview, he does slip into talking about looking 
for Lacey. Not that Lacey's going to come back of her own accord or someone's going to even release Lacey and she's going to be free. No, they're going to be looking for Lacey, suggesting that Lacey is somewhere out there to be found. You have to look for Lacey to get her. And it's just a general lack of gratitude here. There's a lack of gratitude to the media. He doesn't thank the media for keeping the case in the spotlight or even this interview for happening. He's not thanking the volunteers for the work that they have done. He's not thanking the family for taking on um, all the press conference that he wasn't doing. There's an absolute lack of gratitude. Missing is any sense of thanks to anyone else. Scott knows how to run the show. He's been running it with everyone, but he shows no gratitude to anyone that's helped him. Let's talk about some of those suspicions, because there are a lot of suspicions out there. I think people want to know, mm -hmm. first of all, why would you leave Lacey, who was eight and a half months pregnant, alone to go fishing on Christmas Eve? Okay. Um, our day was planned for, you know, Christmas Eve dinner at her mom's house, our mom's house. Preparations were all made, um, gifts done. Lacey was simply going to be baking that day. And it's not uncommon for us to, you know, simply, um, we have separate pursuits. Uh, she does not, you know, play golf as I do, which was my other option for that day. And being, you know, seven and a half months pregnant, she's not going to want to go out in a boat. Um, but it's simply a, a leisure activity to pursue that day. And, you know, it was what our plans were. Um, you know, it may not be everyone's choice to do things like that, but it's the way that our relationship works. So let's get into those suspicions. Um, and the interviewer asks him, first of all, why would you leave Lacey, who is eight and a half months pregnant, alone to go fishing on Christmas Eve? By the way, Lacey was seven and a half months pregnant at the time she went missing, so that's a misspeak from the interviewer. Why would you leave Lacey, who is eight and a half months pregnant, to go fishing on Christmas Eve? And Scott says... Okay, our day was planned for, um, you know, Christmas Eve dinner at our mom's house, our mom's house. Preparations were made. It's not that uncommon to do. We have separate pursuits. Uh, she wouldn't want to go out in a boat. Um, and that's the way our relationship works. He doesn't answer the question. He doesn't say why he did that. He might have said, Lacey encouraged me to go and do my own things. Or Lacey wasn't feeling very physical with pregnancy, but she wanted me to get out and get some fresh air. Or any reason why those things would happen. He just talks in general and gives a lot of bluster, but he doesn't answer the question. But he does say a hell of a lot more. He says uh, dinner was planned, uh, Christmas Eve dinner at her mum's house, our mum's house. He corrects himself. He says her mum's house and corrects himself to our mum's house. I think he's in his head. He said her mum's house. And then he's gone, oh, that makes me sound like an outcast. Like I'm not joined up with that family. So I'll restate that as our mum's house. Um, he says it's not uncommon for us. We have separate pursuits. Now, not uncommon. There's a double negative there. Why didn't he say it in the um, positive? We sometimes did different things. Um, we often did different things. No, he states it in this double negative. It's not uncommon. And when people tell us what things aren't, when people state things in the negative, that's where their focus is. I think it was uncommon for them to do things. He says we have separate pursuits. Um, and he then tells us that, you know, boating was one of his and so is golf. He doesn't tell us about any of Lacey's pursuits at all. I think that's very telling about how he sees the world. So what, what he's really saying in here, here is I went off and did my own thing. Stuff her. I don't know what she did. I have separate pursuits. It was not we have separate pursuits. He doesn't tell us what Lacey's pursuits are other than telling us what she doesn't do. She does not, you know, play golf. Um, then he says she's not going to want to go out in a boat. Well, did you ask her? Because you didn't say you asked her. You're not stating this as she didn't want to go out in a boat because she was seven and a half months pregnant. He just makes the assumption she's not going to go want to go out in a boat. I don't think the question was ever put to her. Would you like to go out boating today at all? Because he doesn't use the words to say that. Okay, let's be fair. He still uses present tense to talk about Lacey. So I've got a whole load of suspicions and a whole load of red flags from Scott Peterson, but he reliably talks about her in the present tense. We have separate pursuits. It's not we had separate pursuits. She does not play golf, not she didn't play golf. She's not going to want to go out in a boat, not she didn't want to go out in a boat. And it's the way, it is the way our relationship works. So he talks about her in the present tense. I know when I approached you, 
on Amber Fry, mm -hmm. and I told you that I would be reporting that you had a girlfriend. Right. Your response to me is that you had no comment either way. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you just come clean then? Well, I'm glad you asked, asked the question. Um, it simply you know, wasn't um, appropriate to comment on it. And unfortunately, there has been a statement um, in the press that I denied it, which was made with um, another reporter when I characterized a National Enquirer article as a pack of lies. Um, and I did so without reading the article, unfortunately. The article I thought to include, and I know also included um, a supposed life insurance policy, supposed blood evidence, um, and I forget what else, but also included the report of uh, Amber. Um, so I um, called it a pack of lies, not knowing that she was in there. So um, it's just not in important to comment about um, that. And I'm glad that Amber came forward. You want me to turn that off? Yeah, and what is that? That's my phone. Unfortunately, I thought it was off. And I'll just answer that question again. Wow. Pay attention to this because he does answer the question again so we can play spot the difference with both answers. Um, he's asked about Amber Fry. The reporter says, I approached you. Um, why didn't you just comment then? Why didn't you come clean then? And he starts by saying, well, I'm glad you asked the question. It simply, you know, wasn't appropriate to comment on it. And then there's all sorts of stuff around the National Enquirer article, some of it quite distanced, you know. Um, there has been a statement in the press that I denied it rather than just I denied it. There has been a statement in the press that I denied it. Very, very passive. Um, basically, he doesn't answer the question. His reason, I think, that he didn't come clean at the time was there was another the, that he denied it, but he didn't know he was denying it. I mean, what the hell does that mean? It is just word salad. He starts his answer with, well, I'm glad you asked, asked the question, um, and I think this is the question's caught him slightly off guard. He needs to buy himself some thinking time in order to work out what it is that he's going to say. He doesn't do very well because it's not very clean and coherent, but yeah, he, he says, well, I'm glad you asked the question. Rather than just answering the question, he gives that, and look, this is, again, is this the guy that's always got to be winning? This wasn't a bad question. This isn't a gotcha question. I'm glad that you asked me the question. So this guy, does he like winning? Does he always have to show that he's in control? Nothing bad happened here. This is a question I'm really glad that I was answered. Does he always just have to be positive about it? I see more of those clinical terms there. Uh, we have appropriate. It's not appropriate to comment. Unfortunately, there's been a statement. Uh, unfortunately, the article I thought to include. So we've got more of these you know, bad luck things that just happened to him. He hasn't quite made the right decision, but it was, hey, it was unfortunate and it wasn't appropriate. I think he's got a real sense uh, of his own morals of what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. He talked about um, his um, the person he was having an affair with before, called her Amber Fry, which is quite formal to use someone's full name, um, but he just shortens it to the much more familiar Amber there um, when he's talking. Um, he's very guarded about the life insurance policy and the blood evidence. He calls them supposed. They are supposed life insurance policies, supposed blood evidence, and I forget what else. That will become important later. And then the phone rings. No, it wasn't your phone. It was his phone. And he says, do you want me to turn that off? That's my phone, unfortunately. Yes, the word unfortunately comes up again, even when he's talking off the cuff because his phone has gone off. But once more, he tries to take control of the interview, saying... I'll just answer that question again. Yeah, if you just want to ask your question again. So he is telling the interviewer how the interview is going to go. There's an arrogance about this man. There's a controlling factor about this man. So he comes back and he gets asked the question again. Are there any differences in the way that he answers the question this time? Yeah, so if you just want to ask your question again, I'll just... Okay, so um, once again, if you can just talk about... <clears throat> Why, why didn't you just come forward at the mm -hmm. time when I asked you if you had a girlfriend? Why didn't you just come clean then? Right, right. Um, at that time, it wasn't appropriate to come about because it's not relevant. Um, I'm glad you asked it because there were reports that I denied it. Um, uh, when I characterized a National Enquirer article as a pack of lies that included um, unknowing to me, I knew that the article included this life insurance, supposed life insurance policy bought this summer, supposed blood evidence and other strange reports like taking the floors out of our home. Um, and I didn't know it included 
uh, you know, this uh, relationship that I had. So I characterize it as a pack of lies, um, and that's come out as a denial, uh, which is it was never intended to be. I simply uh, approached that issue as it's not relevant, and there's no reason to comment about it. You know, there's reason to comment about the number. Now I'm glad that Amber did the press conference. I'm glad that she came forward because it allows us and allows lots of people, I, I believe, to start looking for Lacey again because it's slacked off because of that, because there's suspicion about me. What did you spot there then? He's asked, why didn't you come clean then? And this time his answer is slightly different. We still get this whole word salad. And again, I just I don't think it's true. I think that's why he has trouble expressing himself when he's making things up, when it's not his real lived experience. He doesn't have the authentic words with which to convey what went on, which is why we get this stress-induced word salad. Uh, he did say previously, why didn't you come clean at the time? And he said, oh, because there was an article and I denied it. So it was said that I denied having an affair. Didn't understand that. This time he does say all that, but he does start by saying it wasn't appropriate to comment because not relevant. He doesn't answer the question once more. Why didn't you come clean? It wasn't appropriate to comment because not relevant. What does that even mean? Why so complex? Why is this answer so long and complex? Why could it not just, I didn't want to talk about it at the time? or at the time I was trying to keep my mouth shut, or I realized it would be a distraction, or, or whatever. He talks about what was in this article, um, and did you notice him correcting himself? He says this life insurance, supposed life insurance policy bought this summer. So um, last time he just called it straight out a supposed life insurance policy, but this time he forgets to put that disclaimer at the front of it and calls it a life insurance and realizes his mistake, so corrects himself and says supposed life insurance policy bought this summer. Interesting that it's the life insurance policy that he wants to make us think is supposed, not the fact it was bought this summer. And he's added something in now to the list of things that are in this article, which is strange reports like taking the floors out of our home. In his first answer, he said, a supposed life insurance policy, supposed blood evidence, um, and I forget what else. Second time, he says, life insurance, blood evidence, and strange reports like taking the floors out of our home. So what's happened there then? When he said, I forget what else, had he really forgotten what else was there and remembered it 60 seconds later when he answered the question for the second time? Or the first time, was he a little bit more polished and wasn't going to mention all these strange things that he cannot um, refute? And did it leak out this time? Did he go, oh, I didn't really mean to say that out loud? And also notice the life supposed policy is supposed, sorry, the life insurance policy is supposed, the blood evidence is supposed, the fact the life insurance policy was bought this summer isn't supposed, and neither is the taking the floors out of our home. He calls it a strange report, but he doesn't call it a false report or a lie. He just calls it a strange report and does not deny it. So he goes on to say it's characterized a pack of lies, et cetera, et cetera. And once again, we've got winning Scott, the guy where nothing bad can happen to, the guy who is in control. Um, so he's using his warp logic again. I'm glad that Amber did the press conference. I'm glad she came forward. Nothing bad happens to him. He's in control. Not, he's not going, oh, no, this was a terrible thing that happened to me. He wants us to let us, he wants to let us know that this didn't harm him. This was something he was glad. Why? Because in his warp logic, the fact that Amber came out and said there was an affair means that people can start looking for Lacey again. I really don't get his logic, but look at the term he's using again for Lacey. It's not bring her home or raise awareness. It's start looking for Lacey again. Once more suggesting that he knows she is out there and that she's not going to return by herself. And it, I guarantee the arrogance is just not relevant. I'm not going to talk about what I believe is not relevant. Irrelevant. I, Scott Peterson, get to decide what is relevant and what isn't relevant. And I will be the one that talks about that. You want some more from Scott? She claims you deceived her. She claims Amber. that. Yeah. Yes, she, she did not know. She did not know that I was married. That is correct. Um, and, you know, so I'm glad she came forward. Um, I informed her um, that I am married and of Lacey's disappearance shortly after, uh, you know, um, Christmas Eve. It was a couple of days after Christmas Eve. I don't know the exact date. I'm glad she did the press conference. I'm glad that's out there. It had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. Your stomach must have been turning, though, when you see her 
go on television and it's national. And here's this girl saying, he lied to me. He told me he was single. Sure. I mean, your stomach must have been turning. You know what is a, a positive to allow us to go on to search for Lacey? That's how I view it, and that's how I felt about it. The Rocha family I said, good, this will be, be done, and we can keep looking for Lacey. Wow. The question is, uh, and he interrupts the question. She claims you deceived her. She claimed, and he asks Amber, and he does a lot of interrupting. Now, sometimes I think this is about control. At the end of answers, he likes to leave a pause, and then when the interviewer starts to ask her next question, he continues answering the question. He talks all over as if to say, I haven't finished yet. How dare you talk? Or I'm going to make you feel really bad about talking because I'm talking over you. Here, this is at the beginning, so he talks over a question which suggests he's got an answer ready to go and he does not have the self-control to wait for the end of the question and give the answer that he is ready to give. So it's, she claims you deceived her. She claims Amber? Yeah. Yes, she did not know. She did not know I was married and that is correct. And you know, I'm, I'm glad she came forward. He said he's glad that this has happened so many times. It's convinced me he was not glad about this happening at all. And why is he so strange about the date that he um, told uh, Amber about Lacey's disappearance? In fact, maybe you could help me out with this. I don't know why he's sensitive about this, but he is sensitive about it because he says, um, Christmas Eve is a couple of days after Christmas Eve. I don't know the exact date. I know the exact date a couple of days after Christmas Eve. It would be December the 26th. Um, but obviously he's using couple to mean uh, an unspecified small amount. But why does he have to tell us that he doesn't know the exact date? Why is he very circumspect about that exact date? He could have just said, I, I let her know after Christmas Eve or a couple of days after Christmas Eve. Why does he want us to be sure that he doesn't know the exact date? Maybe there is something in evidence or that came up that you could let me know if you could let me know in the comments or get in touch on social media. Uh, once again, he talks about in the present tense, I am married. Um, a reassuring thing. He does say I was married at other points when he's talking about Amber, but that's he was married at the point in the past where he had the conversation with Amber about Lacey. But he does say I am married. He talks about his marriage in the present tense here. And once more, he finishes with, I'm glad she did the press conference. I'm glad that's out there. It had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. So we've got this glad again. I'm in control. Things are great. I don't believe you are in control. I don't believe you do think things are great. And then he says it, and I believe by it, he means the affair. It had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. How does he know that? How can he say that with such certainty that Amber talking about the, the, the affair had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. Because as far as he's concerned, Lacey was there in the morning, he went out on his boat, and then Lacey wasn't there when he came home. And yet he can say the affair had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. I believe that. I believe he believes that. But how does he know that? He's then asked a question about emotions. Your stomach must have been turning, though, when you saw her go on television, and it's national, and here's this girl saying, he lied to me, he told me he was single. I mean, your stomach must have been turning. And he says, you know, what is, what is a positive is to allow us to go on and search for Lacey. That's how I view how I felt about it. I said, good, this will be, this will be done a week. Keep looking for Lacey. He doesn't answer the question. He doesn't say, no, my stomach wasn't turning. I was absolutely fine with it. I knew it was going to happen. Or, yeah, God, it was a horrible thing to say at all. So he's avoiding the question again. And it's all about emotions. Um, and he avoids the question about talking about his emotions. Is that because he wants to hide his emotions? Because if he told us his true emotions, we would be horrified. Does he have trouble accessing his emotions? Or does he have no emotions? Or does he just have trouble talking openly about his emotions? Whatever it is, doesn't make me feel very comfortable. Look, it's a positive. But hey, go and search for Lacey. Keep looking for Lacey. So once again, we've got that concept that Lacey is out there. She is to be found. She's not going to come back on her own. Now, you know Lacey's family says they can no longer trust you. Mm -hmm. That was, was unfair that? and inappropriate for me to have that relationship. How do you feel, and though, that, you know, the, Ro the Rocha family says they can't they're, trust you? They're wonderful people, the Rocha family. I know that, you know, we all have love between us. And I know that we'll all keep searching for Lacey. And, you know, um, I told Lacey about the, the relationship. Um, she knew about it, and it's an important between us. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to search for her and bring her home. That's, That's another problem people say. had a, a big issue with. A lot of Lacey's family, 
talk to me and friends mm -hmm. saying, if Lacey knew that you were having an affair, she would have said something to someone. She wouldn't have kept quiet about it. I don't know if she mentioned it to anyone or not. Um, I did see a report in the news, an uh, interview with um, a friend of ours, Lori, that indicated that she um, did not believe that I had told Lacey. Um, Lori also said, I know Scott, and he had nothing to do with her disappearance. And that statement to me is what's relevant. Because you can, you know, okay, question my, my morals and my poor decision making. That's fine. But don't stop looking for Lacey. She's out there somewhere. She shouldn't be. She should be with our family. You mentioned. So let's keep working to bring her home. I know that you so he's asked about the trust that Lacey's family have for him. Um, they can no longer trust you. Um, and he doesn't answer the question. Instead, he just goes, yeah, it was unfair and inappropriate for me to have that relationship. Again, these real clinical terms to describe his behavior, unfair and inappropriate um, for me to have that relationship. At least he takes ownership of it for saying for me to have that relationship. But in all of that, he has expressed no regret or remorse about this affair that he was having whatsoever. It's just unfair and inappropriate, almost as if it was a small, trivial thing when it was obviously a huge betrayal of trust and a huge lack of judgment on his side. He expresses no regret and no remorse there. And we see him having control or trying to have control so he's been pressed on this amber fry question quite a bit and he gets to the end of his answer and says that's all i wanted to say as in shut up now i've answered your questions move on to the next subject especially around trust for the the, the rosia family yeah he's being bullying here he's, he's trying to be there and once more we see the thoughts of keep searching and continue to search for lacy it's put to him that a lot of Lacey's family um, have said that if you were having an affair, she would have said something to someone. She wouldn't have kept quiet about it. And he doesn't answer the question once more. He just talks in very general terms and says, I don't know if she mentioned it to anyone or not. Not talking about what Lacey's character is like at all, which is what the premise of the question is, is Lacey's character was not to keep things to themselves. And instead, he moves. He moves on to something entirely different, which is this friend that backs him up, Laurie. Um, also said, I know Scott and he had nothing to do with her disappearance. That statement to me is what's relevant. Of course it is. Someone backing you up is going to be really relevant to a guy like Scott Peterson. Bad things don't happen to him. He's glad all these things happen and he's glad Laurie said that. And when Laurie said that, that's what he wants to focus on. And once more, we've got this guilt trip going on that people are having a go at him, are questioning his character and questioning, did he murder Lacey? And he's saying, if you ask these questions, you're not doing a good thing for Lacey. So don't stop looking for, out for Lacey. She's out there somewhere. So once more, Lacey is out there somewhere. I don't think close to home. She should be with our family. So let's keep working to bring her home. He's saying, or I think he's leaking, that he knows Lacey is not close to home and will not come home by herself. She has to be looked for. She has to be searched for. It's put to him, I know you mentioned during the network interview that only you and Lacey know your marriage. And he says, that's correct. What's correct? He just shut up and said a two-word answer there. There's two parts to the question. You mentioned during the network interview and only you and Lacey know your marriage. So what is correct? Is it correct that he mentioned that during the interview? Or is it he's saying it's correct that only me and Lacey know our marriage? And then he's asked to explain that. And he doesn't explain that. He doesn't talk about his own marriage at all. He talks about relationships, marriages in general, just as anyone's intimate relationship. It's a, it's between those two people. You share things with people. You don't share things with people. So he's talking about anyone's relationship. He's talking about you once more. He's not talking about himself. And he's not talking about himself and Lacey. And he's not talking about his marriage. He's avoiding. And again, you know, he talks about intimate relationships here. But this is a question. This is an answer without any intimacy whatsoever. It's just two people sharing or don't sharing. And this could happen to anyone. Here's some more. Now, did Lacey find out? about the affair or did you just come out and tell her? No, I informed her about it. You I don't believe she knew. Why Why come out? I mean, what made you say, I'm going to tell her today? What What made that day the day to tell her? Just because it was the right thing to do. And as you know, when you're not doing the right thing, it just, you know, eats you up. You know, you feel, you know, sick to your stomach and you can't, 
you know, function and you have a hard time, you know, looking at someone. Right. You mentioned it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But from my understanding is that after you told Lacey, you continued to see Amber. Was that also the I right saw thing her, to do? yeah. No. No, it was not. Explain that. Um, that is the explanation. It was not the right thing to do. But you continued to do it. Right, and it was not the right thing to do. Wow. There's a lot in that section. Um, first of all, he's asked questions um, and he still goes back to talking about you, not him. Just because it's the right thing to do and as you know, you're not doing the right thing, it eats you up. And you know, you feel you know sick to your stomach and you can't function and you have a hard time looking at someone. So this is not about him and Lacey at all. This is a generic thing. Is it put yourself in my shoes? I don't think it is. I think it is things that he hasn't experienced that he's making up and he doesn't have authentic words to talk about how he felt and how he reacted. So he is putting that on someone else, on that you. But this is the nearest he gets to any depth of emotion when he's talking in this interview. You're not doing the right thing. It eats you up. You feel sick to your stomach and you can't function and you have a hard time looking at someone. Now, what does that sound like to you? Because to me, that sounds like what guilt feels like. You're not doing the right thing. It eats you up. You feel sick to your stomach. You can't function. You have a hard time looking at someone. That is a very good description of guilt. But is that guilt about the affair or is that guilt about something else? Well, I'll tell you why I think it might be something else. He does say you feel sick, sick to your stomach and you can't function, i.e. you can't continue. Remember he said earlier, there are times when you can't continue. You're doing something and you just can't continue. Compare that to you feel sick to your stomach and you can't function and you have a hard time looking at someone. I think that's a very, very de de deep for him description of guilt and I wonder if he's describing guilt that he felt in having an affair or if he's talking about guilt in a bigger sense or about something bigger. It then gets farcical as he's pushed um, to explain why he kept seeing Amber after he told Lacey about the affair. He's asked to explain that and he says, um, that is the explanation. It was not the right thing to do. That is not the explanation. <laughs> you know, you have to explain, if you're asked to explain that, you know, why are you dodging the answer to that? Why are you not being honest? Because that is not the, ampl uh, the explanation. Once more from Scott Peterson, no regret. It was not the right thing to do. Again, a very clinical way of describing what he did. Just not the right thing to do. Not the right thing to do. No regret, no remorse, no wishing things could be different whatsoever. And then even after Lacey went missing, you continue to romance this girl? No. She claims that you called her on the 24th and told her I informed Amber about Lacey's disappearance and the fact that I was married. On the 24th? December no, 24th. no, not on the 24th. I believe it was probably the, it was a few days after. She says that you called her on the 24th, December 24th, and told her you were with your parents in Maine. Is okay. that true? Um, the, this is... I called her and informed her about Lacey's disappearance. On the 24th of December? No, no, I did not. It was a few days after that I called her and told her I was married. Okay. But now, she claims, let me just finish, she just claims that you called her on the 24th, told her that you were going to Maine, you were visiting your family in Maine, and then you were going to Brussels. Gloria, I'm not going to waste what little media time we have and in this forum with... Yeah, you know, this is a short newscast, and I don't know how much of these words you're going to use or not. But I'm not going to waste that by defending myself or talking about irrelevant things. Wow, and we're only halfway through the interview, and already it's getting explosive. So, uh, what do we have here? It's more of the same, because um, he denies that he tried to continue to romance Amber, um, and he interrupts the question. She claims that you called her on the 24th and told her, I informed Amber about Lacey's disappearance. So he's getting agitated and rattled here, as you can see. But he's still going back to the old things. He's not going to say the date that he told Amber or he told uh, Amber about Lacey. He didn't call her on the 24th. Um, he says, not on the 24th. I believe it was probably the... 
is a few days after. So I think what he was going to say there, it was probably the, and then put a date on it. So whether it was the Christmas day or the 26th or, or whatever, and he realizes, oh, I'm going to actually give the date here. I don't want to give the exact day that I said this. So I believe it was probably the, and then he just says a few days after. So we had a couple of days after before. Now we've got a few days after. We've got the interruption there. Um, and he really, you know, it's told her um, is what's put to him, and he kind of turns it into informed, very formal language. I informed Amber about Lacey's disappearance and the fact I was married. Why go to that formal language? The next thing that's put to him are more allegations. So she says that you called her on the 20, 24th of December, 20, December 24, and told her you were with your parents in Maine. And he says, okay. So he doesn't deny it at that point. He's kind of absorbing the blows here, I think. And he's asked, is that true? And he's like, nah, this is. I called her. I informed her about Lacey's disappearance. And he's asked to pin it down again to the 24th of December. And he says, no, it was a few days after I called her. And I told her I was married. The interviewer has really got on to him here because she asks to be let finish with this question. She claims, let me finish, she claims you called her on the 24th, told her you were going to Maine, you're visiting your family in Maine, and then you were going to Brussels. And his response is something else. But you'll notice that he doesn't deny anything that was put to him there about saying that he was in Maine or saying that he was going to Brussels. He uses her, her first name, Gloria which I think is to um, flatter her to look like, I know your name. And then he goes on to say how the interview is going to go. He actually knows media better than she does. I'm not going to waste what little media time we have in this forum with, you know, again, irrelevant things. So he's trying to take control here. He's trying to say, I'm not going to talk about the things I don't want to. I think he realizes that he's performing really badly at this point. And so he tries, tries to get her to change the subject. What does Scott say next? It's better served if we talk about what happened and where's Lacey. What happened to Lacey? That's what we'll look at in part two, where Scott talks about the facts as he knows it. He'll talk about the baby. You may have noticed that we're halfway through and he hasn't mentioned the baby that Lacey was pregnant with once. We'll talk about life insurance. He says some more about that. And he is asked the big question, did you have anything to do with Lacey's disappearance? All that in part two. So I'm not going to do conclusions at the end of this because I want to look at everything before I come to conclusions. But what are yours at this halfway point? Let me know in the comments or get in touch on social media. What is important to Scott? What is important to him? The things that he keeps repeating, whether subconsciously or whether he's very conscious about them. Have you spotted anything else that's missing? I've drawn your attention to a few of them. And have you spotted any leakage? Maybe you know the case more intimately than I do. Maybe you know the story better than me. And you spotted some leakage in his words. We'll talk about those all in part two. To get part two, hit subscribe and that means or follow. That means you'll get it as soon as it's released. Although if you want early access, then become a member of the YouTube channel or subscribe on Spotify and you'll get part two as soon as it is made. Please hit that like button so that this gets to more people or share it with people in your group. I always say, but one of the most common ways my content is shared is on WhatsApp. It really pleases me that you will text and send my content to some of your friends, but I don't see it happen, so I can't say thank you. So this is a thank you for sharing this, even if I don't see it. And as always, your comments are more than welcome. Have a look at neveratruerword.com. You will find more podcasts. You will find more videos. You can sign up for the newsletter and also get the Truthful Deception book of which we have based the contents of this analysis on as well. That's neveratruerword.com. And we'll see you soon for something new from Never A Truer Word.